Welcome back. We will now have our first panel discussion, which is on credit risk and how the banking industry managed through the pandemic. The moderator of this panel is Patrick Jenkins of the Financial Times. and welcome to this session on credit risk uh, and managing through the pandemic. I'm delighted to welcome uh, a really top class panel uh, to discuss this topic from very different perspectives. Um, we are joined uh, by Anna Bottin, who is Group Executive Chairman of Banco Santander. She's also President of the European Banking Federation. We also have Elizabeth McCall, Member of the Supervisory Board of the European Central Bank. David Teitelbaum, Head of European Advisory Offices and Head of Global Fig Advisory at Cerberus. And finally, Nicholas uh, Veron, a Senior Fellow at Bruegel and Peterson Institute for International Economics. Welcome, everybody. Thank you so much for being with us uh, to discuss what is a pretty uh, vital topic. Uh, we are clearly still in the middle of this uh, dreadful pandemic. Uh, and uh, you have all been thinking about risk management from one perspective or another uh, for the past uh, 18 months or more. Um, so I'd like to kind of reflect on that uh, and also look forward to uh, future risk management challenges. Um, I wondered if we could start with you, Nicholas, um, because thinking about it from a kind of macro perspective here, um, the key question is how far we are through things, I suppose, uh, to put it simplistically. Um, it does feel like we're at a bit of a pivotal point um, in terms of the debate that's going on in central banks around the world about uh, levels of inflation, about uh, what that should mean for monetary policy. And um, I think it would be really interesting to hear from you your thoughts on, on, on that kind of big picture perspective and indeed whether you agree with that point about being at a pivotal uh, juncture. But first, thank you for having me and, um, and for organizing this forum. Uh, indeed, it's a good moment to reflect on these questions. I think it's uh, perhaps good to start with uh, looking back a bit, as uh, Christine Lagarde and Andrea and Ria have already done today. Uh, but from my perspective, also look back at all those things that have worked pretty well. I think the uh, reaction, both from a central banking monetary policy perspective uh, and uh, from a supervisory perspective uh, in terms of uh, all the shock and uncertainties that was brought by COVID-19, um, that reaction seen in retrospect uh, with the hindsight of now more than 18 months of uh, observation since this shock started uh, has been uh, reasonably good. And, uh, and I don't think one can identify major blunders or mistakes. Uh, and uh, on the contrary, I would say a number of things have worked the way they should have worked. Uh, I think this is true in terms of day-to-day -day decisions. And Andrea and Ria uh, reminded us of what was done in terms of, for example, dividend uh, and, uh, and, and uh, allowing banks to use buffers. I'm sure we'll come back to that. But also in terms of the regulatory framework, uh, for example, Basel III, thanks God we had that at the beginning of the, of the pandemic, uh, so that banks were able to face uh, this shock with uh, sufficient capital. Now, your question is forward looking and looking forward, uh, you know, it cuts both ways, right? Uh, clearly, as we've been reminded again by uh, uh, Mr. Henry, uh, so if, if rates go up at some point, that can be good for bank profitability and uh, from a narrow banking PNL perspective, at the same time, there are plenty of risks in the economy and there are many challenges for monetary uh, policymakers. But because this is a supervisory conference, not a monetary policy conference, I will say that what is probably most important for supervisors is to really keep an acute look at asset quality, to be very mindful of uh, all the uh, extraordinary support measures and moratoria, some of which still exist, even so many of them have been withdrawn by now, and to keep uh, looking really at credit risk uh, in a granular way in bank balance sheets. So, uh, 
and Rinya told us this was the case, and uh, will uh, and and there's no reason to doubt it. Uh, there have been no embarrassing uh, mishaps so far, but clearly uh, there have been a lot of uh, changes in co corporate business models. There are many companies that uh, are not yet back to a normal steady state, uh, and this requires a lot of uh, continued attention. And just one follow up with you, if I may, uh, Nicholas. Uh, in terms of the um, where we are, where we are on this curve in in the eurozone, um, clearly there's there's kind of uh, a lag effect compared with the debate in the US and, and the UK at the moment, for example. Um, do you um, are you kind of factoring in an assumption of of rates staying where they are until kind of Q three at least next year in the eurozone? I mean, I, I, it's, it's not my value added to uh, put a date on this. Uh, I will say that it seems perfectly uh, reasonable at this point that the ECB would not be synchronized with the cycle in the US and the UK. So I'm not too worried about that. Now, how to fine tune that? It will be fact dependent. I think many comments on this tend to underestimate the uncertainty we still live in. So, you know, looking one year ahead is very long. Uh, we still have a virus out there. We still have the possibility of mutation variants. Uh, I think, uh, you know, we shouldn't overestimate the extent to which we know what is going to happen in 12 months time. Okay. Um, maybe a good um, place to bring in Elizabeth. Um, from your kind of perspective uh, on the supervisory side, kind of on the ground, if you like, um, the extent to which, uh, particularly over the past 18 months, the record can be judged, um, both from, as uh, Andrea was, Enria was reminding us earlier, uh, on the regulatory side, on the kind of dividends uh, in particular, um, but also all of that fiscal and, and monetary policy uh, intervention. What, what's your kind of um, view of how that all added up to um, protecting the banking sector and protecting the, the broader economy? Thank you. Thank you, Patrick. And thanks for inviting me today. It's very exciting to be here. Um, a, a couple of things come to mind. First, I would uh, give a, a big disclaimer. I, I'm always a cautious person. And I think that, um, you know, uh, really making a judgment about how we've done in, in uh, you know, final terms, it, we're not we're not there yet. Um, so maybe what I would do is focus on a couple of uh, key things. Um, and the two watchwords that I would use would be um, resilience, um, but also complacency. And, and in the context of those two words, I guess what I would say after 20 months into this, we're, we're gradually moving out of the pandemic crisis and we can see that uh, real GDP in the Euro area is going to exceed the pre-pandemic levels by the end of this year already. So some signs of some, uh, of some success and some concrete uh, signs of, of economic recovery happening. And, um, on the complacency side, while we can see that the policy response have had success, there's there's some uh, some observations I would make. First, there's the strong and the coordinated responses of the fiscal and the monetary uh, policymakers, and this has definitely helped to reduce the impact of the pandemic, not only in terms of the GDP that we can see, but also very concretely um, on the lives of individuals, on households, on corporate, small, medium businesses. And we can see that our objective to cushion uh, the effects of the pandemic, our job isn't uh, the, the health part of that. The, and I would say that's the most important job, the vaccinations and the care of the people in this tragedy that is happening. But we're doing our job, I think, uh, rather, rather successfully in the cushioning aspect. Um, the banks have been able to uh, absorb the shock, the first shock, really pretty well. Um, better than we feared, may I say, and I think we have our, our policy making predecessors to thank for that first because of the regulatory reforms that were introduced after the great financial crisis. And then second, and, you know, maybe I, I, uh, I have a bit of awe about this and it is the, the, the supervise the single supervisory mechanism. Had we not had that, would we have been able to have put such a coordinated response together only and it's only 6 years. Um, after the creation, seven years after the creation, and it's really something quite striking to me to observe the, the real coordination. Um, we can see that the banks entered the crisis with uh, far more, um, uh, far stronger capital positions, 
and that's as a result of, of the reforms as well. And there was additional capital space generated by relief measures from the ECB, by the national macroeconomic ma macro prudential authorities, um, and the, the fiscal supports, of course, to households and businesses help the banks sustain the lending to the real economy. And when we look at lending, um, uh, just to take a look at that for a moment, what we can see is that um, there was a, a much more moderate tightening of credit standards when we look at the reaction to the pandemic and we compare it to what happened post uh, great financial crisis. Um, and we can see that lending continued to households and it even continued to grow two and a half percent since 2019 um, until the mid 2021 point. We can see in the last two quarters that banks have kept credit standards largely unchanged. And this suggests that even uh, in spite of supply bottlenecks, banks are maintaining a balanced view of their of their credit risks. And this is in line with the economic recovery in the last two quarters. And with continued benefit, I need to emphasize this, of the monetary, the fiscal, and the supervisory authorities. So we have a supportive lending environment that is created by the monetary policy. And we expect and see that banks are continuing to accommodate demand for credit. Um, we can also see that the capital ratios in the Eurozone have stabilized. It's around 15.5% CE to 1 ratio um, at June of 2021. And that's um, above the levels when we entered the pandemic, where we were at 14.9% CE to 1 ratio at the end of 2019. So um, I, I would say, though, um, it's it's you know there's good news here uh, quite a bit of good news um we've got a, a stability we've got growth we've got lending continuing we have some protection that we see of households and businesses but i i want to really make sure that we don't succumb to any complacency as we take stock going into the end of the year we really need to encourage institutions to have their houses in order to make sure they understand the credit picture they have the risk management processes in place to identify businesses that might have been struggling when they came into the pandemic or um, as they um, have, uh, you know, in certain sectors certainly been more, more adversely affected by the pandemic. And we need to continue to promote resiliency. Um, history's taught us that in good times and bad, good, strong credit risk management, good plumbing um, is, is essential for, res for a resilient banking sector. So that's um, that's sort of where I would see things. Um, very helpful kind of uh, laying out of the land as, as you see it. What, I just want to um, kind of come back to a, a couple of points that you made there. Um, you quite rightly uh, warned against complacency, but you also said that the banks were able to withstand the shock uh, really far better than the global financial crisis, which is obviously true, but isn't there an argument to say that actually the shock hasn't hit yet that and in fact uh yes the cushions were bigger in terms of capital standards and, and capital levels and in fact they've gone up as you say but the fact that they have been able to go up <laughs> during this period of what otherwise would have been stressed doesn't that speak to the fact that actually the fiscal and monetary interventions and cushions that were supplied means that actually the banks haven't been tested yet at all. Um, you know, it, it's a good point that you're making, and, and it's why I bring uh, a cautionary um, eye to this overall picture. Uh, the pand Nicola said it, then we're not through the pandemic yet. We see even infection rates rising in various countries in the Eurozone right now. Um, and we're looking at, you know, some sort of trajectory to end the fiscal and the monetary. Um, components coming, it, it will come. I, I don't have any crystal ball about when that will happen. But remember, I used the word we've cushioned the effects on households and businesses. Um, you know, our expectation is that um, we will see, well, well, NPL numbers right now are favorable. They still appear to be um, declining from the end of 2019. It was at 3.22% at the end of 2019. And now it's at 2.32% at the end of June 2021. This is a picture that we have to keep a, a real weather eye on. Um, we're starting to see some bankruptcies creeping up um, in certain sectors, especially. And uh, the expectation is that as the supports are removed, you're going to see increasing uh, bankruptcies in this in this type of thing. So um, 
you know, that this picture, this story is not ended. And this is where it's a, it's a very good moment to be strengthening credit risk management um, inside the institutions, the governance of those processes, um, and to make really sure that um, unlikely to pay scenarios, foreborn scenarios, stage one, stage two classifications are being really adhered to. And we have work to do on that. This is the moment to be doing that. Okay, well, maybe we can come back to that uh, in a little while. Um, I wanted next to come to, we've heard the, the kind of macro view, the supervisory view. I wanted next to come to the bank of view um, and bring Anna in. Um, but before I do that, um, I wanted to ask you in the audience um, for your view on this pretty central question, which I'm going to ask Anna about in a second, which is um, what we've just been discussing really. To what, to what extent um, have we seen the worst uh, or not? So the poll I think you're going to be asked uh, to um, uh, vote on is a simple, uh, a simple question, and that is, is the worst behind us? Uh, in terms of the pandemic fallout, or is it yet to come? So I'm hopeful that the technology uh, will work and that you, everyone in the audience will be able to use uh, the the, uh, the voting software uh, to be able to come up with a, um, yeah, a polling result on uh, the extent to which uh, you think the worst is over or it's yet to come. Um, I think it may take a, a few seconds for that to come through. Uh, so I will, I will keep babbling on uh, while while it does. Um, but uh, I think, yeah, I can't see anything yet. But maybe while uh, maybe while that result is is coming in, um, Anna, I can turn to you for your your view uh, uh, on you know it, Elizabeth's point. Is is a is a very important one that we can't be complacent. Um, but would you go further than that? Would you say actually, well, in my rather provocative question, that actually we haven't been tested at all yet? Uh, thank you, Patrick. And um, yes, we are at a very interesting moment. But I, I, I want to start, uh, like Elizabeth, by saying that if we take the perspective of measuring the worst by human life. The worst is probably behind us. And so I really want to stress that first and foremost, we have been in a global health crisis and that has had a very negative effect on the economy. So, uh, you know, we monitor every week what's happening with the health crisis as we think that's the key metric to make us understand what's going to happen. We have effective vaccines uh, produced in record time in 10 months. Usually takes us 10 years. But there is still a major challenge in terms of distribution of the, of the vaccines globally. Um, so, so this is really, really important. So uh, having said that, and I really want to stress that we are very much focused on the fact that there is still a lot of uncertainty about what it means to live with COVID-19 as an endemic disease especially through the winter. So, so we are absolutely not complacent on that. Uh, and that's, to me, a key point. The second one is that we are entering a phase of strong economic recovery uh, with banks exiting the crisis safe and sound. This was confirmed by the EBA stress test, but we do not take success for granted. And so we are very much focused on helping companies get back on their feet, create new jobs, and yes, we need banks to keep on lending. So to me, the real question is, is the recovery sustainable in the face of inflationary trends? Because that ultimately is what's going to drive whether we see an uptick or, you know, uh, credit losses getting at some point worse again. So uh, I want to repeat again that financial institutions, we have been part of the solution. Santander lent a billion euros a day, every day during 2020, as did our peers across Europe uh, and actually uh, across the world, I would say. And so we were very much focused on providing liquidity, supporting businesses and households and so on. Um, all our indicators are showing uh, an improvement on macro, an improvement of the main credit risk metrics, uh, supported by less volatility and, of course, less uncertainty. NPLs have improved, as we've heard. Um, 
the ECB data, Elizabeth referred to that on NPLs, um, has improved year on year by, I think, a bit more than 60 basis points. But, you know, I just want to stress that this is not the only um, concern we have. So, uh, let me just end by saying we're absolutely uh, very vigilant. We are focusing on the pandemic vulnerable sectors from a credit risk management perspective. Um, and we very much support the ECB's efforts with their horizontal reviews on food and accommodation, commercial real estate, because I, I really want to stress that the pandemic has affected sectors in a very, very um, different way. So not all sectors have suffered. Actually, some sectors are doing better than ever. So uh, the, the, the only other thing I would say is that um, given my first point, that we're not out of the health crisis, uh, We've probably seen the worst of the health crisis, but we're not out of the of the crisis. So, um, you know, what happens if we slam on the economic brakes globally and then try to restart the economy? Um, and and what we've seen of the complex networks of supply uh, and distribution, we have never seen this. And so, to me, what is unique about this, and I'm not, you know, I did study economics, but I, there's other. Uh, people on this panel, we have never seen this huge, you know, V uh, uh, crisis, and and this is really what we need to understand better. Is it a demand or a supply or a, or, or both problem? Um, and I go back to my question of if if this is a sustainable recovery or not, and what is inflation? Is it here to stay or not? I think those are the big questions for 2022, and that is going to drive very much whether we are going to see more or maybe we don't see any more um, worsening of the credit um, credit uh, let's say uh, situation on banks and yeah i mean that that is obviously um you make the important point that um uh, uh that the health crisis was obviously the most important thing here for the world and happily it does feel as if we've made a lot of progress over the past 18 months uh, and hopefully there the worst is over on the narrow point a focus for this panel, the credit risk um, uh, landscape. I think, um, well, you've 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 spoken eloquently about your view. Um, the one thing I would um, just to come back to my previous point with Elizabeth, in addition to the kind of inflationary pressures and and um, monetary policy uh, decisions that are that are looming, there is of course the related issue of of the extent to which. Things like furlough schemes and other government interventions, as well as the uh, ultra loose monetary policy, cushions the system, the, the banking system, from effects that will now come through. Uh, that now that the those some of those measures are being withdrawn, and I, just before you um, respond on that, I'll tell you and and everybody else that the uh, the result from the poll. Um, uh, very scientifically uh, conducted, obviously, is that uh, only 38.5% of the audience thinks that the worst is yet to come. 61.5% of people think it's already behind us. Uh, and that is obviously on the credit risk side. And, and would you, Sans, that, like that's kind of your view, Anna, as well? Uh, well, <laughs> exactly. The question is, 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 you know, as I said, I think a lot depends. So all our indicators are positive at the moment. The economies are clearly recovering. The, the big question for all of us that will drive whether, you know, we do or don't see, and, and we're very much on top of, especially the sectors that, that are most affected. But it really depends on whether the recovery is sustainable. If the recovery is sustainable, uh, some inflation, and, 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 you know, some slight increase in rates is actually, you know, going to help the banks, right? So growth with not negative, but let's say slightly positive rates uh, where borrowers can pay back, what they need is growth. And so, so to me, that is the key question. And of course, that yeah. is, I, I want to throw the ball back into the central bankers court, and, and they know this very well, that, you know, how you know how long do they wait and do they err on the side of you know to lose or, or, or on the other side of trying to stop inflation and this is really the the it's, it's a science but I I'd say also an art and so it's, a, it's a yeah it's a pretty narrow path uh and and just to press you one one final small thing then do you in terms of that kind of 
consensus view that the eurozone won't be likely to do anything on monetary policy until uh, third quarter, fourth quarter of next year versus perhaps much sooner in, in the UK and US. Um, is that the right call, do you think? I'm not, I'm not a central banker on the panel. I would defer that to Mrs. McCall. <laughs> uh, but just to cover, because I think I didn't answer your question, but on the furloughs, on, you know, more than 90% of the expired moratoria are actually doing uh, quite well. So customers are paying without significant problems. The levels of arrears are lower than pre-pandemic. And, and I do want to make a big distinction between individuals, consumer lending, and SMEs in specific and more affected sectors. I think that's where banks are, uh, of course, focusing uh, much more closely. And I mentioned the horizontal reviews, which is very much the way to go. We can discuss more details as, as to what banks are doing on that. Uh, yeah. On monetary policy, I'm not, I'm not the expert. I can say that growth with slightly higher rates is a much better environment uh, for banks, right? Um, absolutely. Um, David, um, sorry to keep you waiting for so long to, uh, to have your say. There's there's a very interesting uh, there's a very interesting debate obviously but um, as a as a pretty active investor in the European banking market I wonder what your view is of the way that banks have kind of managed their way through the challenges so far particularly interesting obviously is what's happened on uh, on provisioning I would say I mean there was a lot of very cautious provisioning um, on average. Um, much of which has now been um, written back, those provisions, um, uh, on the assumption that the worst is over, uh, as, as, as the poll uh, has suggested the majority think. Um, what's your view on that, and also what that means for the investability of European banks? Okay, well, uh, two big questions. I think on the first one, uh, I think it depends uh, very much on uh, which economy uh, somebody's business might be focused in to the extent that they're not in multiple jurisdictions, as well as where their balance sheet is focused. As a broad comment, I think, uh, as has been said during this discussion, that the complement of monetary and fiscal policy, together with, I think, the forbearance that's been offered uh, by the regulator in order to take advantage of the buffers, basically, that had been built up following the global financial crisis, uh, and the encouragement to extend credit with the, um, the public guarantee mechanisms allowed banks, I think, in a prudent way to extend credit and keep the economies going, which was ultimately in the collective interest of everybody. So I think that broadly speaking, um, what, what I would observe is that credit policies and, uh, uh, and in fact, probably a more equal approach across economies as the SSM has, has had its role uh, has been quite helpful. I think the ECB has done a terrific job in trying to harmonize, and clearly there is more work to be done, which I think all parties recognize. But I think um, the banks have done a very good job of navigating the crisis. Uh, of course, at the same time, one has to remember that uh, a part of extending credit more quickly than you might normally and during a pandemic is that some modicum, some element of decisioning probably gets de delegated down to a branch level that might otherwise have had greater review at a, at a headquarter level, as an example. So I think um, while I do believe uh, that the uh, the worst, so to speak, and obviously from a human standpoint, let's hope very much the worst has been seen, uh, I still believe that there is uncertainty and I presume we'll get to it um, as it relates to how all of these loans will end up performing as some of those support measures come off. Um, I think irrespective of the conclusion to that, however, i.e. if there is a significant pickup in NPLs, um, uh, I still believe that the banks have, by and large, done a very good job of, of navigating themselves. And the other element of this, both for banks and, and really uh, people outside of even the financial services sector, is the way in which they've embraced technology and have managed, for example, to work uh, remotely. And so I think as a broader comment, the banks have done very well, um, given how dependent they are on their own core banking systems to, um, to navigate that crisis successfully. Um, yeah, absolutely right. Um, I, mean, I think your you, your point on the NPL outlook is is a crucial one, and we'll we'll come to it um, in a second. I wanted to bring um, Nicholas back in, though, on the kind of um, I guess the, the the kind of macro regulatory side of things uh, in terms of um, managing that cycle. Uh, David alluded to the. Um, the latitude that had been 
given at the right moment to to use buffers uh and um is this a vindication uh nicholas do you think of of the system that was put in place as you said thank god for basil three um but what's your kind of overall view of the of what worked well and and maybe whether there were any shortcomings uh in in that kind of a broad framework so you know patrick there's a lot of debate about that and whether there's a fact that um banks didn't eat more into their buffers, uh, whether that's uh, a problem or not from a policy perspective. I, for one, don't view it as a problem at all. I think uh, we haven't really tested uh, what would happen if there had been a need to go more into the capital conservation buffer in particular. And I think we've learned lessons in terms of how the interplay between different regulations and the maximum distributable amounts and all that uh, might prevent that from happening. But the fact that it hasn't happened, that banks haven't uh, uh, taken down their capital conservation buffer, I don't view as a policy failure because that was not needed. What was needed is that the banks would continue providing credit to the economy, and they did that. And they did that without eating into the capital control conservation buffer and what's not to like. So basically, what we've uh, what we've learned is that the counter cyclical buffers are a really good idea. There should have been more of it built up between 2017 and 2020. Some jurisdictions yeah. did it, probably not enough. Other jurisdictions yeah, I gonna, didn't do I it. I was going to ask you on that. The, obviously, the the counter cyclical buffer is a was a was a key innovation post uh, global financial crisis, which you know, going into this pandemic, it's hard to imagine us being um more at the peak of a cycle um uh, and obviously in some ways we've stayed at the peak of a cycle in terms of asset valuations but it was uh, there were many markets um in europe and around the world where um there was zero uh counter cyclical buffer in place which is a bit nuts wasn't it it's exactly uh, the point i was trying to make and uh, that includes the us by the way but it includes uh, i think most european member states uh, and certainly several of the larger ones uh, so uh, the lesson looking back is, yes, there should have been more buildup of those counter cyclical buffers, and that in the current state of regulation is a national responsibility, not the responsibility of the ECB. Uh, next time, which is now, probably it makes sense to think about building up these capital con uh, these counter cyclical buffers, sorry, uh, more quickly than last time. But as to the general architecture of the buffers, uh, which I think is very much being debated right now, um, I don't think we have seen any general failure of the system. Uh, we just need to make sure that there are no negative interference between the conditions on maximum distributable amounts, sorry to talk jargon, and uh, what happens when a bank uh, eats into the capital conservation buffer. But I think the, it's certainly not a good idea to decrease the capital conservation buffer, as some industry lobbyists are advocating. Uh, the only question is whether to replenish or plenish, because they haven't done it uh, in the first place, uh, the counter cyclical buffers, perhaps more quickly than in the past, uh, taking in, on board all these lessons. That would be my summary. A perfect uh, segue to Anna to ask whether you would agree with Nicholas's contention and my contention, actually, <laughs> that um, uh, surely this is the time over the next couple of years um, to start building up that anticyclical buffer, because it was a lesson, surely, that you know, that should have been in place and it wasn't. Uh, well, you know, uh, since the financial crisis, banks in general and European banks have done that, especially over the last, you know, six, seven years, we have built buffers and buffers on buffers, because it's not just the buffers that the regulators and supervisors ask us, but it's buffers on those buffers to make sure that we don't eat into the regulatory buffers. And so I'm sorry if that sounds a bit uh, like uh, in Spanish, it would say trabalenguas, but that's exactly what, what we're doing. We want to make sure that we do not eat even in, onto the not just the required, but the guidance uh, given by regulators. So, you know, um, <laughs> this has been one in a hundred years crisis. Yes, there were a lot of support measures, but I want to stress again, the support measures were not for the financial sector, were directed at people and businesses that were suffering from a, from a war, a war against the virus. 
and it's government's responsibility to take care of its citizens and you know to some extent businesses and, and that's how i think we should see that in that context um and again it's not just european banks but banks across most of the world did really really well so so um uh you know i do think banks are uh, adequately capitalized that we have the buffers and the buffers and buffers we need and we have proven that in the crises and I think the, the, the question is the one you asked at the beginning. So, you know, how much uh, increase in non-performing loans should we expect going forward? Uh, you know, my view, I think I've said that, um, I don't think we should expect any increases in non-performing loans in the coming quarters. Uh, payment indicators are good, economic indicators are good. Big question is, is the recovery sustainable or not? And to me, the question for banks and as a prudent bank manager, the question is not so much what you expect as what you plan for. And it's a big difference between one and the other. So I want to be clear. Our expectation is that we will not see, uh, I mean, other things equal. I want to caveat um, uh, on the health crisis, as I did at the beginning. But, uh, but credit risk NPLs are closely linked to underlying economic growth and the health of the economy, right? And so, um, Again, going to the planning, what is it we plan for? Santander made some of the largest provisions of any bank through the COVID. We had, especially in Europe, a significant SME uh, portfolio uh, on the assumption that a long period of economic disruption would be ahead and could bring a surge in bad loans. Um, again, we plan for it, we continue to plan for it, but much of that provision is still on the balance sheet. And this is what I want to stress, because this is the case for most banks, um, at least in the Eurozone, where those provisions are in the balance sheet. And yes, they will be used down the road, but the provisions are there. They're on the balance sheet. So um, what, what proportion, uh, Anna, of the provisions that you took um, during the height of the pandemic have been written back in the past few quarters? Uh, no, not all of them. No, there's, I mean, uh, you know, we have different uh, systems in the US. Uh, in the US, there's more volatility. Of course, in Europe, IFRS 9 is the first time we're testing that. It is more, it is more, let's say, mark to market, but less than in the US. We, many, I mean, we have the provisions on the balance sheet for the expected uh, losses that our models are telling us. So, uh, this is what's important. So, again, um, I want to make an important point here that is crucial also, um, and this is that the payment culture, and this is really important, you know, the payment culture has been uh, reinforced uh, and has been very important during the crisis. Uh, they have faced the payment commitments, and again, uh, individuals especially have proven very resilient, yes, in part because there were the, uh, you know, the, the support from, from governments. Okay. Um... Can I bring uh, Elizabeth back in at this point? Um, Anna's uh, saying that you know they're they're cautious, they're well provisioned uh, at Santander, but that her base case is that there won't be any increases in MPLs going forward. Is that your? Do you have a similarly sanguine view across the across the industry? Good word, sanguine. <laughs> a supervisor is never sanguine. <laughs> I think we have to we have to recognize <laughs> that. Um, you know, nobody has a crystal ball, right? But we can only um, you know have a have very good thumb on the data and make sure that we have the processes and the information and the projections that are realistic and are appropriate. Um, you know, and I guess when I when I look at the picture. Um, you know, the, the net profits and the banks are recovering. The cost of risk is reducing. It's 70 basis points in June 2020 to 52 basis points in June of 2021. Um, and we, we're seeing that the NPLs are, are going down. I think there is, you know, very good reason to be very cautionary about where that picture goes. Um, in what way? I think it's you know it's it's the case that what's happened is we've we have forbearance in place we have fiscal supports we have loan guarantees and all of this is um, entirely appropriate and it shouldn't be withdrawn in any um, abrupt manner um, but we know that it will end at a certain point in time and if we're masking what the overall credit picture is um, what the asset quality on the balance sheets looks like um, we will we will miss the overall picture. And, 
you know, you can look at um, some vulnerabilities in, in real estate markets in certain countries. You can look at asset valuations also that are increasing quite a bit. I, mean, I think the picture is broader than um, an NPL question, Patrick, really. I think it's, you know, what, what um, you know, where do we see the potential for buildup of risk? And I always call this um, convergence of risk. And if history has taught me anything in my career, it's that, you know, it's where that convergence of market risk, credit risk, um, and op opacity collide that you see um, a buildup of risk that um, can cause balance sheet problems. So, you know, while we're very focused on the asset quality component, I, I really want to emphasize that um, we're looking very much in this um, calm picture that we are in with profits increasing, NPLs reducing, et cetera, at what kind of risk could be building up just beneath the surface? What are, what are the vulnerabilities that are there? And um, Arcagos, I think, uh, you know, has has uh, been something of a um, of a of an indicator to make us look carefully at um, credit risk, market risk, opacity, convergence, and also to correlate that to what's happening with the non-bank financial institution market. It's more than doubled in the eurozone in the last ten years, and so, you know, looking also systemically. Um, this buildup of risk in um, opaque transfers um, of credit risks that have market risk components, structured credit products, for example, derivative products, for example, and, and the lack of visibility across the whole um, landscape is uh, something that, you know, we, we don't see all of the transmission points because there's indirect exposure through portfolios, there's direct exposure through asset management arms, there's direct exposure through lightly regulated, um, Arcagos was lightly regulated in the US as a family office, uh, vehicles that have a lot of leverage. And you know the leveraged finance component is um, something that I think we need to be very, very carefully looking at. In summary, it sounds as if you feel we're in a state of calm before the storm. I would say we're in a state of calm, making sure that we understand what turbulence is beneath the surface. And um, history shows us that in um, times of benign times, where things are going well and um, uh, credit is easy to obtain, and by the way, search for yield is incredibly intense because of the low interest rate environment, that sometimes outsized risk taking can take place. So I, I'm not predicting a storm. I'm more saying um, let's navigate through potentially turbulent waters very carefully, looking at these winds that are there quite prevalently. Okay, um, David. Against that background, um, you kind of started to answer, but I'd love to hear more of your thoughts on on this theme of investability. Uh, of European banks. Obviously, you have been a significant investor in the sector in Europe, um, and there have been challenges along the way, maybe more turbulence to come, as uh, Elizabeth says. Um, what do you think um, could and should be done by policymakers to um, make this a more investable sector uh, and perhaps help to close the huge uh, valuation gap between European institutions and those in other parts of the world, particularly the US? I think the ECB has obviously done a terrific job in helping create a framework for stability uh, for the institutions. And also, as I said earlier, uh, create an environment where the institutions are encouraged to extend credit in a time of uh, distress as we had it, distress as we had in the pandemic. Uh, having made that comment, I also agree uh, with Anna's comment about the buffers on buffers. And indeed, I think one of one of the issues is as banks think about their ability to use a buffer, but the need to quickly replace it, that in turn has an offset impact in terms of the willingness of those institutions to extend credit. That's a bit more of a macroeconomic comment as opposed to a comment about uh, the equity in banks. I think, uh, but but it still gets to the point, which is ultimately investors are are thinking about what the return on equity is, and if the banks are having to carry an enormous amount of equity that drives down the returns. And if a comparable institution and other uh, regulatory frameworks uh, doesn't require as much capital, that's obviously an issue. 
Another one, which I know is sort of a work in process, is trying to create a bit more, um, let's say, uh, of a level playing field across various geographies, because not all risk uh, assets are the same. Uh, in other words, a, a loan that's extended in France may be of a lower risk than a loan extended in another country. And I think understanding um, the differences that are sort of endemic and, and, and also commented about borrower uh, behavior. Uh, I spent a lot of my career working in Asia, and there is a culture in many of those countries where a borrower really takes it seriously upon themselves to repay. And some of the European countries most definitely have that same thing. So I think there are soft issues, which ultimately can be borne out uh, in analyzing the data. But I think all of that is 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 critical, which is saying uh, to the question you asked, which is what would make the environment more attractive? I think one of them is uh, having an appropriate amount of capital that the uh, that the institutions need to carry, while at the same time, of course, um, being being entirely prudent. Another is we talked a little bit about, or I think somebody may have mentioned about dividends. Uh, obviously, restricting dividends force the banks to carry more capital. In turn, I guess they wanted to deploy those the, that, that capital to be able to try and earn uh, an income on it with a lower opportunity cost of not being able to distribute. But also what makes banks attractive for an equity investor is an expectation that over some threshold level, uh, they will see dividends and you're not sort of waiting and waiting and waiting to get the dividends. And so I think, again, when we look at US multiples versus European bank multiples, uh, that's certainly part of it. I also think a burden on the uh, on the part of management, uh, it, which is um, which is I think U.S. banks, because you asked about U.S. banks, are typically more efficient in terms of driving down their cost income ratio, simplifying their products, simplifying their businesses, and um, and so I think this is where, in my opinion, many of the European banks need to, uh, as as I know many Spaniards would say, do their homework. Um, uh, and then another comment I would make uh, to make the market more attractive is to reduce uh, state ownership effectively of financial institutions, uh, because I think that having equity investors who are seeking a return on capital um, also will help make sure that the pricing of, of loans and other products uh, will ultimately uh, uh, reflect the risk that's being taken and, and the value of the franchise that the customer is interacting with. Um, and then finally, probably in terms of driving valuations is, is technology that ties back to simplification and, and ultimately trying to seek a better cost income ratio. So I think that there are things that the regulators are doing and can do, which will make it a more attractive environment for investors. And equally, I think there's more uh, that the financial institutions need to do. Oftentimes the midsize and smaller institutions who may not have the management breadth and depth to be able to, to develop things. If you look at Santander uh, as an example with Pagonext and what they're creating is a legitimate FinTech in a period of a year incubated within the bank, taking adv uh, advantage of this installed base across 10 countries, having kind of an innovative mindset and being willing to invest and stand behind something ultimately will give the regulators better visibility across uh, borrower exposures, but I think it will help drive shareholder value. So thank you. So, sounds like you, uh, you should be investing in, in Santander on that basis, David. Um. <laughs> yeah, well, we, we don't have an investment in Santander, so I feel very comfortable uh, yeah. to speak to the great work being done there. What? Well, thank you. That's what I love that my uh, my one minute of marketing is done by somebody else. Thank you, David. Yeah. <laughs> Pleasure. Um, just just one follow up, David. Um, the uh, one thing that plays into a lot of the the points that you made is the kind of lack of scale in European banking, lack of cross border M and A in European banking, which I know that the ECB is very keen to encourage, and certainly. A lot of policymakers more broadly would like to see and investors would like to see, but it's just never happened. And uh, I wonder whether you have a kind of uh, magic formula for um, facilitating it. I don't have a magic formula for that or anything else, um, but I, I do think that having a easier ability to move capital and liquidity uh, across different geographies is uh, is critical. And also thinking about some of the, let me say the, um, uh, the penalizing implications of larger institutions acquiring smaller institutions and then having to attract uh, more capital around that. So I think that this is, um, I know this is something clearly that the ECB has been talking about and is focused on and is trying to encourage. And indeed, I think it's part of where the future of banking should be. But um, uh, I think that, that we need 
you know, there are a lot of things that I think would, would probably be required in order to change the current paradigm and really start to see an environment of cross-border uh, uh, transactions, which I think would ultimately be great, particularly, if I may say, uh, involving those countries where the banking systems are overly fragmented and, again, where you have very significant government ownership. If private market actors can deploy private capital, uh, typically in the form of publicly traded financial institutions, to acquire these institutions, I think ultimately will lead to a healthier banking system. I'd like to bring Elizabeth in on, on that point in a second, but just to uh, remind audience members that we'd love to take your questions. Um, uh, do um, uh, pose them using the, the button on your screens. Um, the question I just asked David was, was um, an almost exact replica of one that Andreas Kroner from Handelsblatt uh, wanted me to ask. Uh, which was um, whether uh, you see a need for uh, these cross-border mergers, which indeed uh, it sounds like you do. Um, bringing Elizabeth in on that, um, it is something that the ECB has been arguing for, and I know that you have made some uh, efforts on the regulatory capital side uh, to um, not to penalize, if you like, uh, m a uh, on a large scale, but do you think there's more that can be done? No, we, we you're right. We've, um, we published a guide on, on, uh, consolidation to make clear what our regulatory expectations are. And that was largely because we realized that, um, there seemed to be some misperceptions in the market about, um, the stance of the ECB with respect to consolidation and a concern that there would be, um, additional capital charges or um, uh, how would risk-weighted assets be recognized, et cetera. So we've tried to clarify that through the recent um, consolidation guide that we published. Um, we are not here to drive the market, obviously. This is something that has to be, um, there have to be market-based decisions made about uh, mergers and acquisitions and consolidation. Having said that, um, we're also not supposed to be an impediment to it inappropriately. And so, um, you know, my hope is that that guide really puts very clearly forth the position, David, that um, that we've made that um, we're not going to be um, in cases where there is not additional risk being generated, um, additional capital charges being put in place for a consolidation. Broadly speaking, Europe is very much in need of of consolidation. Um, there's uh, there's a, an overcapacity of banking. If you make a comparison between what happened after the great financial crisis in the US versus Europe, uh, the, I don't remember the exact numbers, but the, the consolidation wave that, that occurred in the US was enormous, exponentially um, greater than what has happened in Europe. We have um, impediments that are um, uh, legislative in nature um, that relate to the need, the very big need to complete the banking union especially to put together a, um, uh, an EDIS, a deposit scheme that covers the whole Euro area. But um, I, let me say there's some bright spots that we've seen. Um, uh, m and activity has picked up um, even significantly, albeit much of that has been um, on a domestic basis um, within country where we've seen that consolidation taking place. And this is also good news though, because uh, the driver there is, um, cost efficiencies and you know we we have very much been focused as a supervisory priority on business model sustainability in light of also the overcapacity that's there um, and the need to embrace technologies in order to deliver um, uh, cost effectiveness so um, you know I, I, my expectation is that we would see more consolidation and um, we're very happy to have um, have a uh, have any input about places where we are providing uh, any sort of impediment to consider. Okay, that's uh, that's really good to know. Um, I uh, don't want to stray off the the core topic uh, too much, but I, if we're talking about credit risk, there's two two other issues that I think it's important that we consider in relation to um, the kind of post pandemic um, risk landscape. Um, one is a kind of uh, Maybe well, certainly a uh, a, a vexed topic, uh, uh, and the other is China. Um, we'll come on to China in a second, but on the vexed topic, um, I mean green finance. Um, obviously, we're still in the middle of the COP twenty six event, 
Um, but I think the, the kind of merits and demerits of um, penalizing brown finance, incentivizing green finance, and uh, the whole kind of asset quality uh, issue around that, including credit risk, is a, uh, a hugely important one. Um, and it is going to dominate, I think, the post pandemic landscape. Um, Nicola, I don't know what your uh, thoughts are on on this very big picture, uh, but it would be interesting to hear um, how you think the, the market's going to evolve. So I would relate it to a broader question about transparency and uh, transparency about what banks are doing, which I think is a huge challenge in which um, actually European banking supervision can uh, be part of the solution and probably do more even so they're already doing a lot. Uh, so European banks are not very transparent. Uh, and I think if you think of green finance now, the challenge is not really having somebody out there saying this is green, this is brown, because what we've learned in the past few years is uh, that these sweeping labeling exercises are not, if you allow me, ready for show. Uh, it would be nice to have a system in which we could say, okay, here is the bottom line of this bank or that company's behavior, and here is their green or brown index, but that's not where we are. The issue are, is much more complicated. So what is needed instead is a very granular, very detailed uh, apparatus of disclosure to investors. And I, I'm not cynical about this. I think investors are genuinely uh, concerned about the behavior of uh, banks and companies, but basically what we need is much more disclosure at a more granular level and to the extent possible, more standardized. But that also echoes more issues of disclosure where we haven't had enough, frankly, from European banks, and I will dare say even European supervision. You compare the information that US supervisors uh, give about US banks and the information that is available in general from European banks, be it from the ECB, the EBA, or the banks themselves. And frankly, it's night and day, but the night is not on the US side. Uh, so, um, so you look at the FFIEC portal in the US and all the quarterly information through call reports that is available there, and there's nothing. There's nothing in Europe comparable. Even at a very high level, you want to have, you know, a list of the largest European banks or Eurozone banks by assets. You don't have that. So I would say green finance has been has to be part of a much larger push towards really upping the game in terms of transparency of the European banking sector and allowing investors to make more informed decisions uh, and trust the trust the investor communities that they're not going to be stupid. I mean, there was a debate at the beginning of the pandemic about IFRS 9 and expected loss provisioning uh, uh, versus incurred loss. And this debate is completely forgotten because actually what we've discovered is that expected loss provisioning makes a lot of sense. So it was uh, right for European policymakers to hold their nerve and not say, okay, we have a shock, so we get rid of the transparency uh, because that was not the right thing to do. So basically, my point is to say we need more information, more granular. The banks have to be honest on this. The policymakers have to provide frameworks. The more harmonized the framework, the better. It would be a good idea for the European Commission not to reject the efforts that are being proposed by the International Financial Reporting Standards Foundation and their new International Sustainability Standards Board. Sorry for the, the jargon. Um, and, uh, and there are lots of ongoing discussions about this. Um, but at the end of the day, more data more data that investors can trust, that investors can analyze and then form their own judgment about where is the right trade-off between green and uh, greed. Uh, Anna, do you accept this criticism? You need to be more transparent. Uh, well, I, I, I think we have to be uh, precise. If, uh, if the comment about transparency is on green finance, I, I, I fundamentally disagree uh, in the sense that transparency on green or let's say brown assets for it to be useful has to be comparable and as you very well said the definition of what is green what is brown and a really you know uh, solid and robust framework does not exist and so banks are beginning now and we have done that both uh, you know we run a bank in the european union one in the uk one in the us so 
um, I can say that the, I believe in this case, the European SSM and the ECB are ahead of other supervisors, or at least not behind in terms of requesting banks to provide bottom-up information. There have been consultations, and I think on that, definitely Europe and the UK, if, uh, you know, UK and, and, and the continent are ahead of, of, of the US in terms of uh, what they're asking of banks in terms of transparency and methodology on measuring, uh, you know, the, the climate risk. And so if you're referring to other kinds of transparency, I think we have to be uh, more detailed. There are certain aspects of capital and stress testing where the US is ahead. But I would say that's the only aspect where US banks are reporting some more detail on that than European banks. Um, but again, we report US GAAP, we report in Europe. Uh, it's different it's criteria, clear. as you mentioned. I, I, did, I didn't intend to say that Santander was not doing enough. Uh, I, what, I, what I said is that we have to work on the frameworks. And this is a generational challenge. Right. So, so it's not going to be fixed in one year. Uh, we're at the beginning of a long learning curve of what works, what doesn't, and we should be open-minded. So if it turns out that the European Commission's taxonomy, for example, is too simplistic to work, then uh, it should be revised. Maybe that's the case, maybe not. Uh, but I was not uh, I was not making a specific criticism at any bank or indeed the banking community as a whole. I was just saying there's a big challenge there and it will require a lot of effort. Right. No, no, I'm not, I, 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 you know, I'm not responding uh, as Santander, I'm responding as a European bank, but actually not even that, as, as, as a bank that has operations in, in the UK and US and Latin America for that matter. I, I think transparency, yes, but transparency, one, we can compare apples with apples. And that's really what um, I'm, I'm saying to the market. And, and we already are giving a lot of information. If you go to the climate report of banks, you can see that. But I do think we need to agree on the taxonomy. It, if it's too specific, I think it's as bad as if it's not specific enough. But we do need comparable data and we do need a framework, as you say, absolutely agree, that allows us to compare. For example, you know, when you do stress tests, the scenarios should be as much as possible aligned. And if not, we should be able to say this is the scenario, the other one. But it becomes very confusing for investors. So I do think we need a couple of years to ensure that we are, you know, getting the data that is quality data, bottom up, that we do have frameworks that we can work with across countries and across regions, because this is a global issue. It's not a, yeah. you know, Europe, UK or, or Asia, it, it, it affects the world. And so we do need to make sure that as we report, if we do it in a way that's not comparable, we're not provoking unintended consequences, right? Um, right. you know, let me just give you one fact, because we talk a lot about carbon pricing, and this is a Harvard study that I actually wrote about uh, a few days ago on, on my social media. Uh, financing fossil fuels today is costing somewhere around 20 percent versus three to four percent for the average renewable project. So we are in some way or other pricing already the carbon risk. The issue is if we start reporting or if we start getting asked to potentially add capital because of climate risk, we're going to stop lending to certain sectors. As long as other banks or others are going to support those sectors, we're not fixing the problem, right? But we're also potentially, uh, you know, putting banks uh, in certain jurisdictions at a disadvantage. And so I do think, you know, we have been very uh, upfront on the climate issue. Uh, as a bank and I would say Europe as a whole, but we do need to be very aware of the unintended consequences of trying to compare data that is not comparable, um, of trying to demand certain banks to take action uh, and then allowing others to, to, to replace them. So, I, uh, you know, and, and finally, let me just say one last thing is that, you know, I'm now in Mexico, um, in countries like Mexico, Brazil, but also other emerging economies, People need to buy a home, right? People need to, you know, have access to food for the first time. We need to make sure that we help those customers transition. You know, in our case, we have 152 million customers. Our responsibility is to help, and I'm talking especially about small companies and more vulnerable people that need our help to make the transition. And I think that's something we have to really have front of mind. And David, from an investor point of view, how do you think about this whole topic? 
Um, I, I, well, look, for, uh, for us as an institution, uh, th these issues are uh, incredibly important, uh, both with respect to businesses we already own and those that we look at making investments in. And it's a key sort of work stream of our, um, of our due diligence effort in something which clearly is impacting all stakeholders and a priority. I think that, um, that the sort of new regulatory measures um, clearly will continue to encourage uh, uh, capital to flow away from uh, quote, so called brown energy. Um, but I also think one has to consider that at the extremis, that would have other negative consequences on the balance sheets of financial institutions. So, um, you know, I think there's some element of, uh, let's say, balance that would need to be taken into account, or at least to appreciate the consequences. Um, and I think that's very much in the mind of the ECB in, in, in some of these uh, uh, policies, including the, uh, the climate stress tests, which I believe are being performed next year, unless I'm mistaken. So um, that, that's, that's, that's my view on this. That, that's the perfect segue to Elizabeth. Uh, and, you know, from what, from everything you've heard uh, in terms of the, the challenge for you as kind of a framework uh, provider, uh, what are your thoughts? The, uh, the, I was just going to talk about the stress tests and I think it's very responsive to both um, um, Nicola and, and Anna's points regarding um, the need for data and the need for transparency about that. We already ran a top down uh, stress test um, looking system wide and uh, you know, that driver gave us some important information about risks in different countries um, and, and banks in different countries um, that are uh, related both to physical risk as well as exposure risk on the balance sheets. And we are running next year um, a bottom up stress test um, in the banks uh, directly that will, um, I think, really have the uh, the uh, objective of hardening up the data that the banks have so that we have a much better perspective about that. There is a need to make uh, uh, apples to apples comparisons. This is for sure a correct point. Um, I'd also uh, want to emphasize the point that um, I think we are ahead at the ECB very much so with running the top down stress test already and uh, doing this bottom up stress test. It's um, it's a leading uh, position that we've taken in this regard uh, that has not happened in the US yet. I also think um, that the steps being taken on disclosure and accurate disclosure to investors is going to be essential. Um, and, uh, you know, there are various regulatory bodies that will be charged with that, um, you know, on, on the security side in particular. And we've already seen the SEC starting to take some actions with respect to disclosures that are being made and whether or not those are accurate disclosures or not. So I would expect the greenwashing component to be um, something that has to be very, we have to be very vigilant about. This is a, a clear and present um, prudential issue. Um, and there's physical risk and there's transition risk, but I, I would use the word transmission channel risk. And we have to be um, extremely cognizant of what that means in prudential terms, in terms of liquidity, credit, um, operational risk, um, market risk, all of the components um, come into play. And I think it's um, you know quite a quite an important topic for us to be managing from a risk point of view. Okay, um, we have uh, only four minutes left, um, and while I appreciate it's a ridiculously short space of time to uh, bring in a new topic, namely China, uh, I thought it would be a very interesting uh, place to finish. Perhaps if I could ask each of you to give me a minute, uh, and I will hold you to that on the extent to which you see China as a real credit risk uh, in the post-pandemic economy. Obviously, we've had quite a lot of noise from the property sector in China. Uh, there was uh, a couple of very interesting articles written over the past couple of days about the broader um, junk bond market in China um, getting out of hand. Um, is the corporate credit market in China about to blow up and is that going to blow up the world? Uh, I suppose is my question in short. Um, Nicola first. Uh, the Chinese Communist Party doesn't like instability. Uh, they have a lot of controls on the financial system. So I think they will uh, be willing and able to prevent systemic instability in that space. I'm not too worried. Uh, there will be, of course, turbulence in China because it's a big and complex economy. I'm not expecting that to create shockwaves that would rock the world. 
I think the problem in the real estate market is more about uh, the medium to long term effect on growth. If there is uh, long term deleveraging in that market, that could put a drag on Chinese growth, and that's bad, uh, all things equal, for global growth. But it's also sound because there has been too much reliance on the property market in the Chinese growth model of late. So, so I'm not too worried. Perfectly timed, 60 seconds. Uh, thank you, Nicola. Um, Anna, are you as uh, yeah. yeah, so 95% of our business is in Europe and the Americas. And given that I'm in Mexico um, and that I don't, we don't really have anything of, of any size in China, I'd say that what is happening with, uh, you know, supply chain disruption, globali globalization being at least partly taking a step back, it's a huge opportunity for Mexico. Um, uh, the Mexican economy is recovering really well. There is a huge demand from the US who's, that's booming uh, for factories in Mexico. And I'm seeing a very positive trends in terms of people, not just uh, local investors, but outside investors investing in Mexico, you know, to service a, a huge market, which is the US. So, you know, um, I just want to say that this is a country with a, with, which, which has a lot of upside, partly because of the situation in China, that I will leave to others to explain. <laughs> Elizabeth, to what extent does China figure on your uh, kind of top risks for next year uh, for, the, for the European bank? I, I, I think that the I think that the property um, the the property market in China and uh, the issues around uh, the the junk bond market in China are of concern. Um, I I would say that. Um, you know, there's a not necessarily a concern about direct exposures to the European banks. I, I think that there's not so much a, a direct exposure issue here. It's more an overall market concern that I would highlight um, coming from contagion risk. If there's a sudden um, price correction or asset valuation change that occurs um, as as a result of um, the uh, uncertainty around the China. Uh, property market issues, which are very large, um, I think we would be quite right to have a close eye on any possible contagion risk coming from that. I would note that the Federal Reserve published its uh, financial stability review and did highlight um, the Chinese property sector as a, as a risk. Uh, and the final word today. to you, David. Thank you, Elizabeth. Okay, well, I'll keep it to, to less than 60 seconds. Um, look, I, I think in terms of non-performing loans, which is one of our uh, uh, major areas of focus, clearly China as an individual country has a very, very large inventory of non-performing loans. Um, I think at the same time, you have a banking system that's uh, state owned. And as Nicholas said, there's significant control that the government has. And so I think that um, uh, there are you know, substantial actions that they could take to buffer any of those sorts of difficulties. Um, but on the other hand, one can't rule it out. And the only other thing I would say is, I think that the impact of sort of balkanization of business activity and uh, countries desire to start to have more independence from China in turn creates lots of uh, business opportunities outside of China. Uh, Anna mentioned, of course, Mexico is a big beneficiary, but Mexico is perhaps not alone. Uh, and this is a trend we're seeing in businesses and in governments throughout the world is a desire to have less dependence oftentimes on China. Yeah, um, extremely uh, good point uh, and a good way to round off uh, our debate on um, post uh, pandemic credit risk. Um, my thanks uh, go to Anna Bartin, Elizabeth McCall, David Teitelbaum and Nicola Veron. Uh, it was a really interesting discussion, everybody. Thank you very much. And um, audience, I do hope you enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you, Patrick. Thank you. Thank you very much. You, indeed. Thank you, Patrick. And thank you very much to all the panel members. Indeed, a very rich and insightful discussion, and you packed a lot of issues in there. Uh, so this concludes the first day of our conference. We will resume tomorrow morning at 10 CET with, an, with a keynote address by EU Commissioner Mairead McInnes. And until then, I'll wish you a, a good evening, and I'll see you tomorrow.